I'm very happy to have uh, you here for this um, third session of the week of teaching uh, of the IAS at uh, the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. As I'm, and I'm glad to uh, welcome Mar Perez uh, Saint Agustin uh, as a presenter to this session. And she will tell us about MOOCs and university courses during COVID-19. Amar is an associate professor for computer science in the School of Management, I understand. And uh, yeah. be besides that, she is uh, a long time working on educational technology. And I know her very well for many conferences and uh, projects working together. Uh, she has a very international career. She started out in Barcelona and um, went then to Chile, Santiago de Chile in South America, uh, and then came back, but not to Spain, but uh, she's now associate professor at University Paul Sabatier in Toulouse in France. And she's struggling with teaching in French uh, as we are sometimes struggling teaching even in German to our students. So I leave the floor to you, and I really look forward to your interesting topic, MOOCs at University COVID during, uh, courses during COVID-19. Mar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you very much for the invitation. It is an honor to share with you some of the experiences and ideas that we've been uh, working on uh, through this period, this strange period for everyone. Uh, and this time, and according to what Christian told me, uh, I've organized the talk a little bit uh, with the idea of uh, trying to summarize the main lessons learned that we learned from the uh, processes of making MOOCs in different aspects, from the managerial aspect to the pedagogical aspect, and then explain some of the best practices that we achieve with this, and how working with MOOCs help us to be more prepared for facing the COVID pandemic's uh, needs in this period of uh, lockdown. And I will finish with some of the examples on how uh, French universities have addressed uh, uh, this COVID pandemic using part of the uh, competences that they acquired during MOOCs. In particular, all these lessons learned um, that I'm going to explain today is the experience that I had as a director of technologies and um, uh, vice dean of engineering education in the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, where we ran the digitalization process on how to make the university more digital, but also of two main projects we've been working on uh, in the last years, which is the uh, Prof 21 project that is now running until 2023 and MOOC maker project, which were, which are both European projects. One was uh, interested on looking on which are the capacity buildings needing for building up MOOCs in the universities. And the other one is was to um, understand how learning analytics can help us to understand better how do we learn. So this session wants to capture some of these best practice and I try to organize them in a, in a way that makes sense to understand how that, that these lessons learned can be directly applied to our situation now with the COVID pandemic. So, but before starting, I would like to come back a little bit. I don't know if you remember long time ago when we start st speaking about the MOOCs, no MOOCs were in the medias everywhere. Everybody was telling MOOCs is the change for everything. This is gonna transform the university. Some of the people were scared. Is this gonna transform so much the university that we are gonna lose our, our, our profession, et cetera, et cetera. So these were all the, all the typical uh, media that we were hearing for a long time. But after that, and after a long period of time, and if we look at the Garner's hype cycle, we see that, okay, MOOCs happened. There was a peak in which everybody was talking about, which was good because somehow helped us to rethink about how we were teaching in the universities. But now we are in the phase plateau phase in which some universities are already integrated MOOCs, MOOCs as part of their natural processes. And they are trying to use these MOOCs for improving their teaching and learning practices they, they make every day. But what we saw 
during the COVID pandemic in which all, almost all the universities in the world were closed and locked down during the convening, uh, during the COVID pandemic, especially in March this uh, last year. Uh, we saw that at least people that was have been working with MOOCs but had the means for working with MOOCs were kind of a savior for the situation. We saw that institutions that have been working for MOOCs for a while, institutions that were used to produce digital content because they have a MOOC process background, et cetera, et cetera, were better prepared. In fact, what I, what I like to say is that MOOCs, even if are not the panacea for changing the higher education as, as we, 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 some people uh, said in the past, I see MOOCs as a catalyst for innovation, a catalyst that help us to face better the digitalization processes that we have to face as uh, higher education institutions, not only for facing the COVID pandemic, but also for transforming our institution as it is they are now, right? So today, I wanted to share with you some of the reflections on what are the key aspects that I think that changed that MOOC processes and MOOC development change in our institutions and make us more prepared for facing new transformations for the future. The first one is the capacity building. When I, when I talk about capacity building, I, I refer of two main aspects. When you want to digitalize some of your curricular content, when you want to update some of your practices and transform it to the traditional processes, to digital processes, there are two things that have to be hand by hand. One is you need to support teachers and managers in your institution with new infrastructures. And the other is that you have to do organizational changes. The first thing and the most important or one of the keys is these infrastructural changes. I don't know how is your university right now, but most of the universities that were doing MOOCs, they had like, they developed like an studio. I don't know if you in your university have, you have an studio, but usually you have an studio in which you can record, et cetera, et cetera. That is something that we didn't have before MOOCs. So this is something that is already part of our infrastructures and that has helped us to be prepared for future digitalization content, et cetera, et cetera. This is an example of, of a particular uh, uh, studio. Usually you have to put between 15 and 20, this is the minimum 20,000 euros. This is the minimum budget for having a studio that is more or less complete. But also we have prepared our, our, our teachers for uh, making their own content, right? Um, I don't know, maybe some of you are already prepared, but I have colleagues with all the setup in their, in their, in their desktop at home with the camera, with two screens, with the tablet for writing, et cetera, et cetera. And this is something that also was integrating with the MOOC generation because MOOC generation can, can be done in different, different different type of, of content and different qualities. And this was very helpful for certain activities. And this is more or less like a budget of 6,000 6, euros if you are okay. But we also need servers and platforms, platforms for uploading our content, et cetera, et cetera. And Christian just told me that you've been uh, accepted as, as a edX, edX members. Uh, this is a very good news. edX is a very good platform that evolves uh, and it's updated every very well and, and it works as a as a as a group of universities which is also interesting because you can share experience and you can share um, best practices and I think that this is going to be the platform where you can use and the good thing about edX is that um, you can also use it for uh, your curriculum, your, your campus courses. So you can have different uh, type of courses. You can reuse the MOOCs that you've done and close it for your, for your campus students, which gives you a lot of, lot of possibilities as you will see in the next slides. 
This is the part of the infrastructures, but nothing is possible if you don't, if you don't change the university, not only the infrastructures, but also the organization, right? For making it possible uh, to design and, and build your own digital curriculum, you don't only need a good infrastructure, but also some organizational changes has to be done. In the University Católica de Chile, what we did is to create a group which is called Technologies and Innovation, uh, in which we had to hire three different people for supporting the digitalization process. One was the instructional designer, who was in charge of helping teachers to actually design their curriculum for digital. A technician helping for the platforms and giving, giving some ideas on how to use the platform and maintain the platforms, etc. And an audiovisual producer uh, for helping in the audiovisual production. Only this group was able to support uh, six MOOCs per year production at the university in a professional level and other four, four MOOCs more for on-campus purposes. So this is like at least the minimum team that you need to support. But when you're doing organizational changes, what, what we saw that it was very important to is to create a culture around the digitalization. And for, for that, we had to change some of the processes. Let me share with you one of the processes that we launched to make uh, digitalization part of the university culture. One of the things was to propose a call for courses. Uh, when I arrived to, uni to the university, people uh, were selected by hand for doing the MOOCs. But what I, I thought it was interesting is was uh, not only to select those people that usually are more enthusiastic and I open to digitalize their content, but to create a culture and then helping people know what a MOOC is, understand what they could do, et cetera, et cetera. So we ran an open call where people could apply for doing a MOOC. And in this open call, we helped them to understand what a MOOC was, doing some courses. And also we invited them to record a test, video test, to see how this works, to see that it was not that hard, et cetera, et cetera. And this was part of the creating the culture process, right? Then uh, we prepared, when, then we gave support for the design process in which uh, teachers participated in these different workshops. Then we went, we gave some support also for learning about the platforms and how to upload that material, et cetera, et cetera. Then we did a pre launch process in which different teachers were involved in validating the different courses. And then we launched the course and we tested this course before uh, making uh, it open to everyone. Um, I have to say that this process is iterative. A MOOC, one, you created a MOOC, you cannot leave it uh, as it is. You have to update it, you have to review it, you have to follow it up. So it's important to have in the university people or teachers or teaching assistants that are always looking at some improvements. This is one of the things that have to change. So these are the key aspects for making any digitalization process up. Changes in the infrastructures and changes in the organizational processes. But then we have to also to form our teachers to be able to um, create their courses that, as best as possible. And here I collected some of the lessons learned about the digitalization process of making on how to do a good online course. If you wanna make a MOOC or if you want an online make -on course it's not the same that doing a face-to-face -face course. And it needs much more preparation. I don't wanna scare anyone. It's very nice to make a, a MOOC or an online course, but you have to rethink a little bit what you've done so far. And the first thing you have to do is to plan and organize your curriculum differently. When I mean differently, I mean thinking about what we call learn learning sequences. We don't have to think about a particular course or an hour. I have an hour for giving some of the topics of my course. I have to think about small learning sequences that anyone can follow in an autonomous manner. So you have to think about small uh, capsules, we can say, that you can put, it to, put them together as a block to form a whole curriculum. Just to give you an example, a course of uh, 10 credits, for example, 
uh, it's, it's three MOOCs usually. So you usually have to translate, if you want to translate a normal course in a MOOC, usually it's not only one MOOC, it's uh, three MOOCs in, of five or six weeks maximum. And this uh, process of creating the curriculum has to be very, very, very well thought. And we, for example, in our, in our workshops that we organize, we make uh, teachers think about these learning sequences in, the, in which they had to think about uh, different aspects. For example, we make them to think about what do you want to teach in one week time? Meaning that one week time means, for example, five hours for the student, independent study, considering all the videos and, and all the materials you're facilitating. This means that you have to think about the main of, of learning objectives, the type of activities that you are gonna propose, and also the type of assessment for each of the linear sequences. And this has to be thought as a whole. And for example, one week could be uh, three learning sequences or four learning sequences in which you include different videos, different uh, assessment formative and, and summative assessment activities, and then some uh, collaborative activities, for example. And this has to be a learning sequence. So the first uh, lessons learned is, okay, if you want to rethink your curriculum, you have to stop thinking about one lesson in which I give a lot of topics. You have to start thinking about small learning sequences that you put together for a content of a week. Then we also learned that uh, some of the video content that we were producing uh, after, after some, some, some experiment with the teachers, we arrived to five things that they have to consider always when doing a video. And they are considering now we're doing videos for the COVID pandemic. First, using some simple PowerPoint templates. You don't have to do very sophisticated templates. You have to do simple templates that you can reuse. And for reusing them, you don't have to make reference to dates or time. If you want to reuse a video, you cannot make reference to time or dates. You have to update the content and you have to forget about dates. Another thing very important if you are gonna open your content is to use images on Creative Commons. Now we have to think about this. If we are reopen, we have to think from the beginning in the, uh, in the image production to use images that we, have, we can use. Uh, to be sure that you don't use or to you refer to particular brands or companies that you cannot to refer. Because, for example, people from management, they were making reference to, to brands, particular tele, uh, telephone brands or things like that. And you have to be sure that they can, you, can, you can refer to them and you have the rights, right? And then you have to try to move from the typical descriptive videos like uh, explaining a topic and that's it and move from more practical videos in which you can you can play a little bit let me show you an example of what i did for teaching my students how to do a programming course i asked them uh, how they would uh, make an egg and i asked them what are the steps that you have to follow for making an egg right and then uh, they were, she's, she's, she's that girl talking about how you do an egg. And I, I was following this, the, the, the steps of doing an egg. And I was showing that if you are not clear to a computer, you cannot do an egg, right? It looks very simple, but it's not that simple. So I was trying to tell them, look, what, when you talk to a computer, you have to be very, very, very strict with your with your messages because the the machine is gonna do what uh, what you tell them to do, right? So this is a little bit the idea. Uh, what we what what I wanted to sh to share with you is that we have to try to move from the traditional videos in which we explain the things like we are doing now, right now, and to try to use the video for making something different, right? And finally, uh, we have to try to foster participation. One of the things that we realize is that uh, working online is very hard for the students. We, we need to try to foster participation. And we had a, um, a paper there from 2014 in which we analyzed what type of reaction we observed from uh, the students in a MOOC when we were pushing as practitioners the uh, uh, messages in the forums, in Twitter, in Facebook, and we see how the messages of the students 
uh, grow as you as you help them to be more social, right? So these are the three aspects. First, some tips from uh, how to produce these learning sequences. Second, do videotapes that help you to be reused later on and then foster participation. When you have your online content, when you have your mock produce, uh, all this digital material that you produce give you a lot of, lot of opportunities for creating new learning models. And this is what we were experiencing and trying to analyze. Uh, and the idea at the Universidad Católica and later on in the different projects we were participating was, okay, we have invested a lot of economic effort and human, human resources effort on producing digital material. What can we do now for transforming our university, right? Not only for producing online courses that we can provide to anyone, but also to transform our learning processes. And then after some reflection, we arrived to this nice framework that we call HMOOC, hybrid MOOC. Uh, and the idea of the framework is to help you to have some ideas on how you can reuse already created MOOCs, right? We can talk about books, we can talk about online content, we can talk about any digital content you have, okay? But this is more or less the, the framework that we arrived. And this is a framework organized in two axes. This axis on the X axis, we have the institutional support, mean, meaning once you have the digital material produced, how much effort have to do the university in terms of economic efforts, uh, human resources efforts, for supporting this transformation. And the y-axis is how the content, the digital content you produce is aligned with your curriculum, with your um, curriculum now, right? So here you have like four, four models that we, that we propose as a reference, but you can move these models around this, this axis. That's why they are access. And we see, for example, that we call MOOC as a service, those MOOCs that were produced already at the institution and that you offer to your students, but you don't align the content of this MOOC completely with the curriculum. This is the typical case, for example, for if you want to reinforce some competences and you give them a book to help them acquire these competences, but these competences are not gonna be part of their evaluation in the curriculum. These are gonna be a complement of a course or, or something like that. In the other extreme, in which you have like a lot of effort from the teachers and from the institutions, and it's completely aligned with the curriculum, is what we call the MOOC as a driver, meaning that the MOOC is the driver of your learning path. And then you use the MOOC for making complementary activities around. This is the typical flipping the classroom process in which the, the teacher has to invest a lot of time on rethinking their curriculum and uh, making it around the MOOC. I'm gonna explain two of the examples in, the, in these two extremes with some of the results we got from using them. But before I would like to also talk about what we call the MOOC as a replacement and what we call the MOOC as an added value. The MOOC as a replacement is the case in which you can use a MOOC already created and you give credits to your students for doing this MOOC. For example, I have MOOCs in ethicals on in use of ethical data in computer science and I, I give them to, to them and then I, I, I do a final exam and I give them credits for that. This is very low institutional effort, but very high curriculum alignment. And finally, we have the other extreme. extreme. You have a MOOC as an added value in which you use a MOOC, for example, within your course. Imagine you are doing a course in data science and you, wanna, uh, you want your students to make a, a, a MOOC on uh, how to use data or the, how to, I don't know, uh, analyze data with R and you make them to do within your course of data science a MOOC on R. And this is what we call the MOOC as an added value. You add value to your course. It's an effort from the students and the teacher side because you have to very well integrate your course within your curriculum. 
And this is not gonna go uh, directly recognized as credit during the MOOCs. It's gonna be part of your, of your curriculum course. These are the four models that we found extremes. Then you can, you can find different, you can, dip, you can redo these models and, and replace it in, in, in the axis and find different models from them, right? But these are the three models. And today I wanna share with you some of the data that we get from two, two of these models. What we call MOOC as a service, and we call it in the university remedial MOOCs, and what we call MOOC-based flipped classroom, which, which is the MOOC as a driver. The first situation in which we use the MOOC as a service that we called, it was for the following. At the University Católica de Chile, uh, when the students enter to the university, it's an engineering school, they have to need, they need a basic levels of math. And some of them, they don't come with these levels of math and they need to do some courses apart and so on. So what we propose is to propose four MOOCs on the main topics of, of the basic math courses. This was not very, very, uh, this was, didn't mean a lot of effort from the university once the MOOCs were produced because we let them register to these MOOCs and it was not mandatory to do them it was mandatory to assist to a diagnosis exams after this period, right? So the, the, the students that from uh, until, until then, they didn't have an, any resource for preparing the diagnosis exam. Now we provide them with different MOOCs for making the diagnosis exams. And then when they did the diagnosis exams, we saw if they had the level or not. 70, uh, 752 students took the diagnosis exams and from this 589 used these MOOCs. And what we observe it is the following. We gave them 10 days for doing the MOOCs and then pass the exam, the exam. What did we learn? We learned the following. We saw that students were not very, very, very happy to, add, to use the MOOCs if they were not mandatory. So we saw that those having better marks from the previous school, they were the, the ones using uh, the MOOCs, you know, like the more enthusiastic people. So we have maybe, and this is what happened uh, the, the, the next year, we made them mandatory. Second one, they were especially active before the exams, right? So during the first days, they were not active and then you, you see a peak and they were very active before the exams. We realized that MOOCs were not a good mechanism in this case for learning concepts, but for refreshing those concepts that they already know. So that was very useful for once you know one concept, you can refresh these concepts. And finally, <clears throat> It was very good for us to understand what were, where were the gaps, right? When you saw more activity in particular MOOCs and in particular activities in certain MOOCs, we realized that we, these were knowledge gaps for our students and we could reinforce in our courses these knowledge gaps. For example, we saw that they were not good at trigonometry. So we had to reinforce our, our courses in trigonometry. So it was helpful for different aspects, one to refresh in content for our students and the other time to understand what, how to reinforce our curriculum in the future, right? This was one of the examples that I wanted you to give. And now I'm gonna give you what was the experience with the MOOC-based flipped classroom. So what we did, there was a, a, a course in, in management about how can you do good enterprises and how can you manage enterprises and so on. That usually was done as a traditional course, right? With face-to-face uh, -face classroom, activity, practical activities, discussion activities, et cetera, et cetera. But the teacher had done two MOOCs in Coursera. So he wanted to reuse these MOOCs for flipping the classroom. And we did that. And we did that uh, as a follow. We do two groups, an experimental group and a control group. The control group was following the traditional course with the same content and the same way as ever. And the experimental group was flipped, meaning that they were doing part of the content in their houses, and then they come to the course and they work in group, as you can see in this image, right? The same teacher in both, in both groups, uh, the same equivalent content and the same evaluation text for, for making it comparable. And this is what we learned. 
the people from the experimental group was much more prepared for the evaluation. They had more working group uh, activities, so they had more time to discuss between them, and then they were much more prepared for the evaluation sessions, especially for the analysis of the case, use case, typical use case that they use in management, right? Students in the experimental group had statistically higher marks. Even if we control these marks with their GPA, meaning the, 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 the scores that they had previously. Uh, so the GPA in, in Chile is the, 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 the notes that they had so far in their, in their curriculum, right? Like the higher marks, all the marks that they had. So we, we control by the higher marks and we saw that this did an influence. It was the mechanisms that helped them to have uh, higher marks. And again, we saw that the students were especially active during this time, the exams period. And in fact, we realized that some of the people in the control group were asking the people from the experimental group to, to for, for the videos and the exercises to practice during the, the, the exams period. So the, the, the experience was, was very interesting in terms of uh, seeing how you can transform a course, but it always was very positive for the students and for the teachers. And from this experience, a lot of teachers wanted to change all this. So these are two examples of how uh, once we have digital content, we can reuse it to transform our typical teaching learning practices. And some of these new learning models were those which were applied in France in some institutions for facing the COVID pandemic. And here I would like to share you some of the strategies that different institutions and different uh, courses adopted for the COVID pandemic. Some of them had already their MOOC courses. Some of them had digital content which were not in the MOOC format, but were useful also for the COVID pandemic. And some of that didn't change at all. In fact, when the, when the crisis, the COVID crisis started, all the news and media in France were, okay, university is a chaos. Because no one had to know how to do, all the universities were managing as they could, et cetera, et cetera. And the result was that there was not um, one directive, like each university could do as they could. And the, we have, I'm gonna share with you three different examples of how different universities manage this, okay? And they go from more presential courses to purely online courses. So we have the first case in which uh, they didn't want to change that much. They were not prepared. They didn't feel prepared to move online. So you, they wanted to keep as much as possible the face-to-face. -face. There is the others that changed the hybrid. They made this kind of hybrid process and they were some that decided to go completely online. The first case, what they did, did, they did, okay, what can we do? We can put people, 12 people in our classroom. Okay, no problem. We are gonna divide, divide the courses. We are gonna make small groups. We are gonna reduce the hours that we are exposed uh, face to face. And we are gonna organize the classes so that we people can sit separately. They go with the max, we put uh, control, blah, 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 blah. This was to maintain the status quo of the university. Okay, we are not gonna do, do anything else. We are just gonna reduce our content. And the problem there was that the, you found instead of, find, uh, of meeting your students three times per week, you were meeting them one times per week. And they were, uh, teachers were giving all the, all the courses hyper concentrated, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a little bit chaotic, but well, they were managing this as follows. They, they had like, groups of 12 people in practical classes which are smaller and group of 60 people for um, big classes that are usually of 300 uh, in big classrooms so that they could open the doors etc etc and then they give the material using Moodle or Teams through online because some of the groups when when from some of the students where they care, were COVID content they had to stay at home in quarantine so they had to follow somehow the courses this is the course that they didn't change. Then we have the hybrid. This is what we do in our department. And this is how we manage. 
So what we did is, okay, we are not lose, we are not gonna lose the face-to-face -face part because we thought we thought it was important also for the students not to drop out, right? But we're gonna mix online and face-to-face -face classes. So we divided our groups in days. You had different days in which Monday were for group one, Wednesday for group one, and Friday morning for group one. So you were putting all the students together in a in a bubble and they weren't mixed to each other so if one of the students were with the COVID you move all this group online right and then we were doing when they were not face to face they were doing the class online so instead of meeting the students three times face to face you meet them once online once face to face and you do this part mixing online and not online and you give, gave also the possibility to attend the other groups that, for example, were in quarantine to online courses of the other of the other groups. So if they lose some of the sessions, they could they could join to the online meeting. This works very well. Uh, we are following this process now. We work especially with Teams, Moodle, and uh, Fun, which is the edX edX uh, platform for the um, from the ministry ministry of education in france and uh, we use digital support and this keep the the students well update up to date to the to the content and everything and they followed very well the 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 results are very good on this on this process and then there were other people that just decided to go and move everything online and to transform all the material online. And this is the case of a, of a project that they were run for a, a master. That's it, is it an inter-university master that is called Miash. And what they ask is for money to the ministry saying, look, we need some money to transform this. And what they are doing is they are uh, 14 universities involved so each university is producing content online and they are sharing this content and they are doing a huge online master in which all the students from these universities are attending. And it's been very successful too. But because they had the money, they had the infrastructure and they have the organizational processes already working. So these are the three cases. Some of them already done from the digitalization process and we use it to uh, survive this COVID pandemic. Other ones just uh, use the lessons learned from the MOOCs and try to redo and um, use the money for the COVID pandemic for addressing the COVID pandemic for really transforming, which is the case of, case of MIH. And so people didn't do anything, I just the, 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 <laughs> the traditional way. And these are the ones that are less, happy right now. I wanted just to finish with this uh, and just to remind you some of the conclusions that I wanted to highlight before finishing. Um, well, the lessons learned after working for more than six years in digitalization, pro producing MOOCs and online content is that uh, in any case, we have to rethink how we are teaching, not only for the COVID pandemic, but for the pandemics to come, but also for the, the future of our education, because the students now are more used than ever of using digital content and are being adapted to our, our new ways of learning that we have to, to benefit from, right? But for rethinking education, we need to rethink us in a holistic manner. We need to rethink about the infrastructures, about the organization, about the good practices we learned. We cannot forget the good practices. We are not reinventing the wheel every time. We have to learn of what we've learned. We have to reuse what other institutions have learned. And this is very interesting. Then we have to think that investment in digital content means also investment in new learning models that we can benefit from in the future and that we have to rethink on how can we introduce this. And we have to think this as a strategic plan of the university. It cannot be an individual effort. It has to be part of a strategic plan with an effort from the uh, higher managers, thinking about how can we transform the education. MOOCs are not the panacea, but at least are an instrument for exploration and for experimentation. And we have to benefit from what we learn and others universities learn from the process as a mechanism for informing our decision-making. 
And this can help us for facing the COVID pandemic as many people have been doing. I'm gonna share with you some of the references I've used for preparing the, 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 um, the, the talk in my blog. I'm gonna share it tomorrow or something like that, just to share you some of the, uh, uh, of the, um, of the papers that I've seen uh, on how people is managing the COVID pandemic. And we see that they have many, many different ways. In China, they are digitalizing everything. In, in Latin America, some are using MOOCs, some are reusing MOOCs from other universities. It's quite interesting to see how they are doing and how they are managing the learning practices. And I, I didn't want to finish this uh, talk with a message, a message that I always like to highlight from Eric Fromm that says, in any case, if we want to change, if we want to transform, innovations requires having the courage to let it go of certainties. We are gonna face uncertainties. We are facing uncertainty. We are used to face uncertainty and we have to live with that. And without that, we are not going to change anything. So just forget about what uh, what it has been working so far, and just to try experimenting and exploring how it can work for the future. Thank you very much, and I hope I can answer your questions. If you have questions or comments, I will be happy to do that. Thank you, Mar. This was very exciting and very enlightening. And I like to open the floor also for questions to uh, from our audience here, uh, what they have uh, with respect to our uh, to your presentation. And I see Ivo has already opened his microphone. If I may, so thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. And I'm uh, <clears throat> I have one question to start because you mentioned these different strategies that you had in France for uh, now probably the second uh, lockdown or already yeah. the first, I don't know. <laughs> but I was wondering if, because we have very similar setting at our department actually. And I was wondering if there is any data, which strategy of the three you mentioned was the most successful in terms of, let's say dropout rates or people not finishing the semester. Is there any data available? Uh, not now so far, because we are collecting it now because we just closed the semester in December. Okay. So we are gonna today. I have a meeting in the department to see how it went. <laughs> so I will have more data today. But from my department, meaning this hybrid mode, what we saw is that at least I have all the students in the second year, and only two drop out. And there were two that from the first year they they passed, but kind of like this, and the rest they follow very well. So this is like qualitative data I can give you right now because I, I don't know scientifically, I don't know, I don't know the quantitative data so far, but I could share with you as, as, as soon as we had. Oh, with, but I was we, just wondering. What we have, and this is happening at the university level, which is enormous, we have 30,000 students. What we have seen is that an increment of psychological needs from the students, especially those that come from the, um, which are not, uh, which are foreign students, which are very close in their rooms and they don't have any contact with anyone. And the, the, the services of psychology, they are, they have been exposed and they have been adding some psychologists because they have been some problems. In this case. Yeah. And then another question, if I just make another statement, is this, um, this online pre-course for the math uh, students or the math. Uh, I was wondering if there is any kind of uh, coaching or learning analytics involved in that one, or is it just a MOOC that they're supposed to um, do before they start the semester? At that point in which we were doing the experiment, there were courses that they had to follow. Uh, before starting without any other support. They had the typical analytic support on how much activities have you done, uh, what are your marks right now, et cetera, et cetera, but none more supports than that. Uh, what we did, however, I didn't show in this, in this, in this talk, but what I, I'm exploring on I'm, my research now, and this last year has been focused on supporting self-related learning in online, learn, uh, on online MOOCs, right? And what we observed in another experiment is that we provided them with an analytical tool 
in which you show them how they evolve in the course and how they evolve compared with their with their their colleagues and we saw that this type of awareness helps for in motivation and help on um, on super, on downloading a little bit the dropouts but that was for a course completely MOOC not a not a MOOC for uh, our students in the campus that was an open MOOC and I don't know if this would work in a in a hybrid this is a project that I'm gonna start exploring right now okay thank you you're welcome question now yeah, um, just for this hybrid setting uh, which you described your second yeah. option at the university which you have been following i mean was it really then the way that you had half of the class or one group was there in presence and the other on the same time was then also from from home that they joined online or how did it go uh, yeah. so there were two mains two two different ways myself i didn't de i never did the face to face plus uh, mm -hmm. online at the same time because i found it very confusing for the students like uh, you you move on your blackboard and they then mm -hmm. don't follow really much and it's a mess so what i did personally was i um, recorded previous videos simple videos like five minute videos with some of the definitions and content and then i uploaded it in moodle in this case and then i do i replicated the face-to-face courses like with practical practical sessions and i replicated the online courses so i repeated twice mm -hmm. the course online and the course uh, face to face it's not very efficient in terms of uh, human resources because you repeat twice but uh, it was easy easier for the students to follow so they know, they knew from the beginning that this course was online, this course was face-to-face, -face, that they had to prepare some content before the face-to-face -face that I was providing them online. And, and this helped them to be very well prepared for the face-to-face -face classes. And in fact, the face-to-face -face classes were much better than last year because they come much more prepared. And mm -hmm. that was a very, very good outcome. Other colleagues, they did this mixture, right? For not replicated the courses, they were doing face-to-face -face while online mm -hmm. for some other students, but they had always troubles with the connection. Some of the people they didn't hear very well. It was hard also because our infrastructure doesn't allow us to have a very good uh, hybrid um, connectivity. But if you have in the university, if you have mics, if you have, if you have like, I know that, for example, in the Carlos III de Madrid, which is a university in which I did my postdoc, they have a huge setting in classroom, which is very, very good for doing this. And they have a blackboard that you can write and they see it in their screens with a camera that records at the same time the teacher and the blackboard. Uh, and this is perfect. If you, if you have this infrastructure, it's good. If you don't, I do not recommend it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Petra uh, Lustenberger, she is uh, raising her hand for quite some time now, so I give her the floor for her question. Thanks, Christian. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, I very, um, I'm really studying into learning techniques, also digital lately, and I was very, it was very interesting to hear that um, you, uh, that when you have the three groups that you compared, that the MOOC group was, um, had better uh, grades and was better prepared. And this actually also um, uh, confirms my hypo hypothesis that involvation into the learning material is uh, really important and can be improved by MOOCs. My question um, for, uh, is, what I was interested is, is a very, we often wonder when we do MOOCs, um, do you have any, no, do you know, did the students more likely prepare their their material before they had they had a lesson or were they more to um repeat the lesson after uh, repeat the repeat material after the lesson 
this is a question that I had discussions about and I just wondered if you had any new uh, knowledge um, about this uh, the fact how the students are dealing with this MOOCs, how they use them. That's a concrete question, maybe you can... This, no, yeah, 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 this is a very interesting question, in fact. And I will share with you the publication so that you can have the data and all the, the things. And I have another one, which is the what we call the orchestration, which is the instructional design, okay? So we, what we realized is the following. We wanted them to be prepared before the class because otherwise uh, they were not going to benefit from the class. We test the first class to make not the video and the content preparation at home mandatory. So we didn't put anything and we observed that they were not accessing that much to the content. So what we decided is before starting all the face-to-face -face classes, we left 10 minutes test, a 10 minutes test, like very, 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 very fast test that you open at the beginning of the course and you give them 10 minutes just to review, to be sure that they have seen the content at home. And only adding this small test, it increased a lot the activity of the students before the course. So we saw that adding this small test, uh, uh, it was mandatory and, they, and we give them like a, a small, a very, very small zero, Po uh, point zero 0.01 uh, to the final note, like, I don't know, we made like 10 tests and it count one point in the final note. But with this, we already um, achieved our objective that was they have to come prepare. And then what we saw is the following. If you put this test at the beginning, they come more prepared and they, they benefit much more from the classroom uh, interaction. And they told us, after all, what they said is that, wow, working in this type makes you more, uh, makes you, makes you uh, uh, work harder than in a traditional course. I'm working more than ever in the course, you know, because they had the feeling that they were actually learning by their own. Because usually they were used to attend the class, then review a little bit the notes and do the exam, right? And now they were, they were the ones preparing the course and then attending and putting into practice the content. And that at the beginning, they thought that they were investing a lot of time, but we calculated this uh, investment of time and it was only perception. In fact, they were not dedicating more time. They were ordering, having the, the impression that they were dedicating more time because the time that they were dedicating, it, was, it required more effort from their side. So what we saw is that we had to add this small test at the beginning, and then we saw that people uh, prepared their courses before, and then we saw that before the exam, they were reviewing some of the contents, especially for, uh, for particular aspects that were not especially clear, or for particular aspects that they had a lot of definitions, something like that, they review. So we observed in the MOOC activity that they were preparing for the courses because of the test. And then that they were reviewing the content once they had to prepare the exam. And that was interesting. That is real interesting. Thank you for sharing. It's very inspiring. You're welcome. I will share with um, the papers with Christian and maybe Christian can send them because I don't know if you have access. Uh, so I can, there are some papers that explain the instructional design we follow, what was the role of the teacher in each of the classroom and uh, what were the main results in terms of behavior and things like that. Well, uh, lovely. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So maybe Great. adding to this question, Christian, if I may add another question. Um, Go ahead. So this is what I'm always uh, thinking about because it's the only incentive if you have an exam at the beginning of the, the this MOOC um, kind of um, teaching, or is there any other way to foster this participation online? Okay, what we did, so before transforming this course, in a completely flipped classroom course. The previous year, we tested a flipping classroom activity during uh, two weeks. 
Okay, we saw, okay, we make traditional and then we do two, two weeks of uh, flipping the classroom to see how it works, right? Mm -hmm. So, since the students, the problem is that the students, we do not train our students to be prepared before the classes, especially in scientific uh, topics, right? Because uh, in scientific topics like computer science or, or like physics or maths, or biology, they are used to come and learn from what you explain, and then they review what you have explained. Not in literature. They are used to come with the book read, right? They, they read the book before going to discuss about Shakespeare, right? But we in science, we are not used to that. So uh, what we observed is that changing the methodology is hard also for the students. So they are not used to be prepared. Uh, they are not used to, uh, it's not a, a self-initiative that it's, come, it's gonna uh, grow like, like, you know, wow, it's gonna work better. Yeah. What we tried in this, in this week was the following. We make like a jigsaw uh, practice, meaning that uh, you had to prepare one, uh, one particular part of, of, of the course. And then you were mixed randomly with different students in the, in the course. And each student was in charge of uh, preparing a case study with the part of knowledge that they had previously prepared at home. This was for avoiding the, the exam at the beginning and for forcing them to be prepared because otherwise they were uh, not helping the team, right? So they had social this, pressure. Exactly, the social pressure. The social pressure worked. In yeah. fact, most of the students were doing, hey, my colleague have not prepared this, he's not, and they came prepared for the next session. That was good. This worked because the group were randomly assigned. You cannot make them to, to make their own group because they prepare, they have to be random. And this logistic, uh, in terms of logistic, was a mess because they were 150 students. They arrived at the classroom and you had to distribute that randomly in the class. So we had like papers in the table with their names. They have to look for their name. They have to sit. So it was complex in terms of uh, logistics. It was good because it avoid, you, you, you could avoid uh, making the test for forcing them to prepare because you had you had this social pressure mm -hmm. and also because at the end of the this practical session they had to deliver a project that was counting for the for the final marks and if you were not prepared you were not able to finish the project during the the, the classroom time and they were losing points right so somehow at the beginning or at the end you had to put the the points as a reward for making the course grow, mm. but you have different mechanisms. Yeah. However, uh, when we when we make the whole course flip in the classroom, we up, we we chose the exam and the test because the the logistics for the group and randomly grouping and things like that, it was so so hard. But if you can do it because you have a lot of teaching assistants, it's good. But if you are alone, uh, I don't recommend you to do that. It was crazy. It was crazy. So now it will be easier with the breakout sessions in Zoom, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So if you do something like that, you can do it. But I then we organized the for presenting the results of their projects. What we organized is a pyramid process. You know, like uh, you have the groups um, presenting between them. You put two groups together, you present the results, then you decide which is the best result, then you jump, you put four groups together, you decide what is the main group, and then you decide four students that go to represent the different groups in class and they present with a mic in front of everyone the results so that you can create a dynamic, right? So that. Hey, thanks. <laughs> So this is really inspiring educational reasoning that goes into there, uh, into that kind of flipping and hybridization. And we're, uh, 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 we have filled our time already. So uh, I'd like to close this here. And thank you again, Mar, 
Uh, and I like to uh, send out a short uh, organizational information to the people who are here. Um, tomorrow, we will start at 10.30. And Fabian Zehner from the DIPF will talk about um, natural language processing for essay assessment, so open question assessments. How can we optimize that? So I look forward to have you tomorrow at 10.30 uh, in this very room where we can then uh, attend Fabian's presentation. So thank you, everybody. I stopped the recording now.